media is so central to how Americans think about things. It didn't happen if it didn't come on TV. It didn't happen if we don't have a picture of it. Where do these images come from? What is the relationship between these images and American foreign policy in the Middle East? We've had a history of denigrating and bestializing the Prophet Muhammad, Islam, and Arabs as a people. The new moral geography represented the Middle East as a world of dangerous religious fanaticism. You're in my country now. You're my wife. You do as I say, you understand me? 1979 is the great turning point uh, in the history of the 20th century and indeed in the history of our times because the consequences of 1979 in Iran are comparable with the consequences of 1789 in France. It's a revolution of world historical importance and its reverberations carry on to the present. American evangelical Christians were taken by the idea that the founding of Israel would lead to the second coming of Jesus. In every case, it was said that those who oppose Israel are against the forces of goodness in the world. They're evil. And so, Arabs come out very badly in this scenario. Well, I just wanted you to know that I'm a Jew. This is my country. The anger at the United States for its policies in the Middle East, for the utter failure to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, led to an increasing sense of hostility toward the United States. Bin Laden entered the tent and put his Kalashnikov down beside him in his white robes, and, you know, welcome uh, Mr. Robert to this place, it's good to see you again, blah, blah, blah. His last words were to me, I pray to God, Mr. Robert, that he permits us to turn America into a shadow of itself. of all history changed, but it certainly made the identification of the alien others really, really simple. Because we got a really spectacular terrorist event, and we got a very, very ra rapid dramatis personae cast list, and lo and behold, they were all them guys. So don't you think that they are the guys we should be frightened of? Now, this is a conversation that you and I ought to have, but let's not take yeah, the time of our resource one, people. May we go to the next question, please? Thank you very much. Because the answer would have been that uh, our relationship with Israel uh, is one of the main reasons that we have a terrorist problem. And the Israel lobby does not want that message to get out to the American people because it would then force Washington to change its policies towards Israel. There's often sometimes there's sometimes a gutlessness that we don't want to like push the boundaries of what of what can be written or what can't be written. And to me, that's the that's the problem. So over and over again, you see what you do is you you change and diminish the language of the conflict. The wall becomes the fence or the barrier. The occupation zone becomes the security zone. The occupied territories becomes disputed territories. Um, settlements become neighborhoods. And so we make the Middle East unintelligible for people who don't live there or visit there. And then I went to the ticket counter and I wanted the guy to know whose side I was on, so I caught myself enunciating English like never before. <laughs> I wanted him to know, I was like, hello, my fellow American. How are you? Yes, I'm here to board the aeroplane. <laughs> Carry-ons? Just this American flag, that's all I'm carrying on. <laughs> Arabs are the most maligned group in the history of Hollywood. They're portrayed basically as subhumans. Untermenschen, a term used by Nazis to vilify gypsies and Jews. These images have been with us for more than a century.
For 30 years, I've looked at how we, particularly when I say we, image makers, have projected Arabs on silver screens. In my latest book, Real Bad Arabs, How Hollywood Vilifies the People, I looked at more than 1,000 films. Films ranging from the earliest, most obscure days of Hollywood to today's biggest blockbuster. <laughs> And what I tried to do is to make visible what too many of us seem not to see, a dangerously consistent pattern of hateful Arab stereotypes. Stereotypes that rob an entire people of their humanity. All aspects of our culture project the Arab as villain. That is a given. There is no deviation. We have taken a few structured images and repeated them over and over again. You are hostages of the holy freedom by Whether one lives in Paducah, Kentucky or Wood River, Illinois, we know basically the same thing. Listen to the sound Jesus. of our God. We know the mythology. The mythology, namely Hollywood's images of Arabs. We inherited the Arab image primarily from Europeans in, in the early days, you know, maybe 150 years, 200 years ago. The British and the French who traveled to the Middle East and those who didn't travel to the Middle East conjured up these images of, of the Arab as the Oriental other. The travel writers, the artists who fabricated these images and who were very successful as a matter of fact. And these images were transmitted and inherited by us. We took them, we embellished them, and here they are. When you cross the mountains of the moon into our country, Mr. Tarot, you will be stepping back 2,000 years. We have this fictional setting called Arab Land, a mythical theme park. And in Arab Land, you know, you have the ominous music, you have the desert. We start with the desert, always the desert as a threatening place. We add an oasis, palm trees, a palace that has a torture chamber in the basement. The Pasha sits there on his, you know, posh cushions with harem maidens surrounding him. None of the harem maidens please him, so they abduct the blonde heroine from the West who doesn't want to be seduced. When we visit Arab land, we must be aware of the instant Alibaba kit. Have, we have the property masters of Hollywood going around and they're cladding the women in see-through pantaloons, belly dancing outfits. They're giving the Arab villains scimitars, you know, these long, long scimitars. We see people riding around on magic carpets, turban charmers programming snakes in and out of baskets. Yesteryear's Arab land is today's Arab land. You are late. A thousand apologies, oh patient one. You have it then. I had to slit a few throats, but I got it. Disney's Aladdin was seen by millions of children worldwide. It was hailed as one of Disney's finest accomplishments. But the film recycled every old degrading stereotype from Hollywood's silent black and white past. Oh, I come from a land, from a faraway place, where the caravan camels roam. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Now, how could a producer with a modicum of intelligence, just a modicum, of sensitivity. Let a song such as that open the film. But this moves way beyond one song. You must be hungry. Here you go. You'd better be able to pay for that. Do you know what the penalty is for staying? No! No, please! The Arab is one-dimensional caricature. Cartoon cutouts used by filmmakers as stock villains and his comic relief. And so over and over we see Arabs in movies 
portrayed as buffoons, their only purpose being to deliver cheap lies. You see this in the Joey Heatherton film, The Happy Hooker Goes to Washington. Every night I was forced to perform unspeakable acts with circumcised dogs. Well, dogs are better than sheep. They're cleaner, I know, I've tried both. And over and over again, they're portrayed as inept. So, in a movie like True Lies, not only are the Arabs dangerous, they're also incompetent. I, we are all prepared to die. With one turn of that key, two million of your people will die instantly. What key? That key! Who's taken the key? One actor who excels in his portrayal of Arabs as buffoons is Jamie Farr in Cannonball Run 2. I have a weakness for blondes and women without mustaches. All the stereotypes are here. Too rich and stupid to know the value of money. Get me 12 sweets. Better yet, the entire floor. And of course, he's oversexed, lecherous, uncontrollably obsessed with the American woman. Here, my desert blossom, give the change. Have you ever considered joining a harem? And so another pattern is the lecherous Arab. In Jewel of the Nile, Sheikh Omar tricks Kathleen Turner. How? He convinces her to come with him to Arab land. Then he imprisons her. You stay here and you write what I tell you to write. We see the same sort of ominous seduction and protocol. The entire plot revolves around an Arab emir's infatuation with the blonde, blue-eyed Goldie Hawn. In the Bond film, Never Say Never Again, Kim Basinger is abused by the most sleazy-looking Arabs imaginable. She's tied to a pole, stripped to her underwear, and auctioned off to primitive-looking Bedouins. And in Sahara, Brooke Shields is also kidnapped and presented to the lecherous Arab sheikh for his own perverted pleasure. Get away from me, you dirty More than 300 movies, nearly 25% of all Hollywood movies that in one way or another demean Arabs contain gratuitous slurs or they portray Arabs as being the butt of a cheap joke. We were going in a mecca seat and the plane is full of Arabs with these animals, goats, sheep, chickens. I mean, they don't go anywhere without their goddamn animals. We had to put plastic in the cabins. You know, they urinate, they defecate. You have films by Neil Simon, like Chapter 2, the beginning of the film. The protagonist arrives back from London, and, and his brother says, How was London? And he says, Full of Arabs. How was London? Full of Arabs. Well, imagine if he had said, Full of blacks, full of Jews, full of Hispanics. I mean, that's ridiculous. Why do we do these things? We gotta bite it. One of the most offensive films with the gratuitous images, Father of the Bride 2. It features Steve Martin selling his house to a Mr. Habib. Justin, we like house very much. When you can move out. Excuse me? The Habibs would like to buy the house, George. It's exactly what they've been looking for. It's when you can move. We need house a week from Wednesday, and my wife wants flower dishes in kitchen. You sell, we pay top dollar. When Habib's submissive wife tries to speak, he shouts gibberish at her. And then he offers Martin a $15,000 cash bonus to move out in 10 days. Making real estate history here, When Martin tells Mr. Habib that he doesn't want to sell the house after all, he finds Habib's wrecking crew there, ready to demolish his beautiful home. <laughs> and in a scene that calls to mind one of the most degrading stereotypes of the Jewish people, Mr. Habib demands an extra $100,000 to sell the house that he has owned for just a day back to Martin. You want me to take out a loan on something I own free and clear just 24 hours ago? Well, that is up to you, George. Your path, your offense, your memories. Now, if you look at the other Father of the Bride films, Elizabeth Taylor, Spencer Tracy, there were no Arabs or Arab Americans. So why does Disney inject these horrific sort of offensive characters in Father of the Bride Part Two? 
It's the same reason that in Gladiator, the slave traders who kidnap Russell Crowe and bring him back to Rome are Arabs. Right. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, why does Hollywood inject Arabs, scenes of Arabs, and or slurs demeaning Arabs, and movies having nothing to do with the Middle East. So you're sitting like I am, for example, watching Back to the Future. Oh my God. About a mad scientist. Tell me, I don't know how. And yet, early on in the film, we see these ugly, inept Libyans with machine guns in a parking lot trying to gun down the protagonist. I mean, why? This movie wasn't about the future. It was the same old stereotyping from the past. And the same goes for Hollywood's view of Arab women. The Arab woman today is bright, intelligent. She's someone that, 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 who is exceeding in all professions. And yet this reality still is being denied us on silver screens. The highly sexualized belly dancer has been with us from the beginning of Hollywood's history inspired by early images of the Orient as the place of exoticism, intrigue, and passion. But in recent years, this image has dramatically changed. The Arab woman is now projected as a bomber, a terrorist. Added to this image is what I call bundles in black. Veiled women in the background, in the shadows, submissive, it seems the more Arab women advance, the more Hollywood keeps them locked in the past. Politics and Hollywood's images are linked. They reinforce one another. Policy enforces mythical images. Mythical images help enforce policy. Jack Valente, president of the Motion Picture Association of America, has said, quote, Washington and Hollywood spring from the same DNA, end quote. The Arab image began to, to change immediately after World War II. There were three things that impacted the change. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict, in which the United States has unequivocally supported Israel, the Arab oil embargo in the 70s, which angered Americans when gas prices went through the ceiling, and the Iranian revolution, which increased Arab-American tensions when Iranian students took American diplomats hostage for more than a year. These three pivotal events brought the Middle East into the living rooms of Americans and together helped shape the way movies stereotyped Arabs and the Arab world. One of the primary changes, the image of the Sheikh. In a movie such as Rollover, he's out to take over the world with his money, or he's up to no good trying to buy chunks of America. Mrs. Winters, I think I should tell you there are those in the family who do not think we should be making this offer at all. I assume if you could have found venture capital of this sort for a company like Winterchem in America, you would not be coming all the way to Arabia looking for it. You see the oily shake in Spielberg's Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. You see the money-grubbing shake who's out to commit all kinds of terrorism and launch a missile in earnest in the army. Gentlemen, behold my special club, the Pluton missile. With it, I will bring the infidels to their knees and the leader in the Arab world. One of the myths in the 70s was that the Arabs are coming over buying up chunks of America. This and of course, steel. this was that reflected in the, the cinema. The Arabs have taken billions of dollars out of this country, and now they must put it back. One of my favorite movies of all time, racist though it may be, is Network, about commercial television. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it. How do you feel? We're mad as hell, and we're not going to anymore. Network features a TV anchor rising to superstardom. How? He unleashes wild rants against the system on the air. But he directs the angriest of all his rants at Arabs, who he says 
are buying up America. They're buying it for the Saudi Arabian Investment Corporation. They're buying it for the Earth. The anchor, Howard Beale, calls on the American people to rise up and stop the Arab buyout of his TV network. Listen to me, God damn it. The Arabs are simply buying us. There's only one thing that can stop them, you. The rage of Americans you. in response became one of the most famous scenes in movie history. I want you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and write a telegram to President Ford saying, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. <laughs> This kind of anger, the anger born of fear, all of it in response to a perceived conspiracy and threat by a specific group of people, well, we've seen and heard this before. If we look at the anti-Semitic propaganda of the Nazis, at its core is an identical type of economic threat this economic myth even made its way into children's books. Sadly, the popular image of Jews and Nazi propaganda resembles the popular image of Arabs in some of our most beloved Hollywood movies. The only difference being that the Arab usually wears a robe and headdress. Another way we can look at the connection between politics and entertainment, Washington and Hollywood, is the manner in which historically cinema has projected the Palestinian people. Since the founding of the State of Israel in 1948, our support has never wavered. Every American administration has made it clear whose side we're on. In contrast, Washington's policymakers have failed to support the millions of Palestinians who have been made refugees and who have lived lives of poverty and squalor as a result, while policies impact opinions. So equally unjust is how Hollywood has presented the conflict. Movies repeatedly depict Palestinians as terrorists, making it seem that all Palestinians are evil. Made in America, Colonel. Now that image has been perpetuated by Hollywood films, beginning with the film Exodus. It dealt with the very early conflict. Here, Palestinians are either invisible or they're linked with Nazis, perpetrators of horrific acts. The 1966 movie Cast a Giant Shadow is another early film presenting Israelis as innocent victims of Palestinian violence. Kirk Douglas is an American military specialist, and he goes to assist the Israelis. Some of the dialogue in this film reads like it came straight from the public relations department of the Israeli government. Now here's a country surrounded by five Arab nations ready to shove them into the Mediterranean. No guns, no tanks, no friends, nothing. People fighting with their bare hands for a little piece of desert. The Palestinians in this movie are the lowest of the low. We see them solely as vicious gunmen, wide-eyed maniacs. They will kill anyone, anywhere, anytime, for any reason. There's one brutal image in particular of a burnt-out bus with a dead Jewish woman tied to its side, with a Star of David carved into her back. And when the Palestinians finally speak, they mock and psychologically terrorize another woman trapped in a bus. Well, if we jump forward a decade to the film Black Sunday, the Palestinian terrorist is now a woman. Striking where it hurts them most, where they feel most at home. She flies the Goodyear blimp into a Miami stadium and tries to wipe out 80,000 Americans at the Super Bowl. She cold-bloodedly eliminates anyone in her path. The 
The movies that we see basically follow Washington's policy. It's reflected in the cinema over and over again, particularly during the 1980s and the 90s, where you had perhaps 30 films which showed Palestinians as, um, as a people who were intent on injuring all Americans. How may we help you, Jad? One of the most despicable portrayals of Arabs and Palestinians occurs in the 1987 film, Death Before Dishonor. First, they murder a guard, and then slaughter an Israeli family. They kidnap and torture an American Marine, and in cold blood, execute another. And they burn the American flag right in front of the American embassy, and then dispatch a suicide bomber to blow it up. One reason we've not been allowed to empathize with any Palestinian uh, on, on, on the silver screen is, is due to two Israeli producers, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. These two filmmakers created an American company called Canon, and they released in a period of 20 years at least 30 films which vilify all things Arab, particularly Palestinians. They even came out with a film called Hell Squad, showing Vegas showgirls trouncing Arabs in the middle of the desert. I think the most effective film they've ever done, one of the most popular and most racist, is The Delta Force. Here, Palestinians hijack a plane and terrorize the passengers, especially the Jewish ones. Pick out the passport with Jewish names. There is no form of communication more powerful than film in creating propaganda, and Golan and Globus took it to another level. Certainly American producers play a role in vilifying Palestinians. I mean, perhaps the most anti-Palestinian film is true on. This apparently is the same group which just detonated a nuclear bomb in the Florida Keys. Crimson Jihad will rain fire on one major U.S. city each week until our demands are met. This film is shown on television almost every week, over and over again. It is part of our visual heritage. Give me the key. Come on, child. You don't want to die, do you? Give me the key, and you won't get hurt. I give you my word. No way, you wacko! And we never see, never see, Palestinians who suffer under occupation, Palestinians in refugee camps, Palestinians who are victimized, who are killed, innocent Palestinians. These images are denied us. Now, why are they denied us? Is there an unwritten code in Hollywood saying we cannot and will not humanize Palestinians? I mean, why can't we humanize Palestinians in the same manner in which we humanize Israelis? Is not the life of a Palestinian child media-wise, Hollywood-wise, politically-wise, as important, as humane, as valuable as the life of an Israeli child? And if the answer to that is yes, why can't we see that on silver screen? To solidify Washington's connection with Hollywood, simply look at the films produced in cooperation with the Department of Defense showing our men and women in the armed forces killing Arabs at random. Like Iron Eagle, where a teenager goes over and bombs up an Arab country. You know, just learns how to fly a jet overnight. <laughs> 
And then, of course, Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen goes over to Lebanon and obliterates scores of Arabs. All right, Chief. Let's go tag him and bang him. Of all the Department of Defense films, the one that will stand the test of time as being the most racist is Rules of Engagement. The film was written by former Secretary of the Navy, James Webb. The action takes place in Yemen, a real country in the Middle East. There are violent demonstrations at the American Embassy and the Marines, led by Samuel L. Jackson. They're called in to evacuate the American employees. And as they try to do so, the Marines open fire on the crowd and kill scores of the enemy, including women and children. And in the investigation that follows, Tommy Lee Jones, the lawyer who represents the Samuel Jackson character, goes to Yemen to investigate. The movie leads us to believe what seems obvious, that the Marines committed this atrocity. Armed American Marines, they were shooting at his people. They were just trying to defend themselves. During his investigation, Jones's character sees a little girl with only one leg. He follows her comes upon a hospital ward full of civilian victims. He finds an audio tape by the bed of one of the victims. And when the tape gets translated in court, we immediately begin changing our minds about who is responsible for this massacre. To kill Americans and their allies, both civil and military, is duty of every Muslim who is able. We discover that the Yemeni civilians aren't so innocent after all. It turns out they fired on the Marines first. And in a moment that will live in Hollywood infamy, we suddenly learn that the little girl we've been sympathizing with, the very girl whose humanity and innocence may have broken down our stereotypes, well, she's no better than those other Yemeni terrorists. As a result, when Samuel L. Jackson delivers the key line, Waste the motherfuckers! we're now on his side. Why does this matter? Because in the end, the massacre of even women and children has been justified and applauded. It's a slaughter, yes, but it's a righteous slaughter. Sergeant Mack. Sir? Contact all stations. Mission complete. The humanity is not there. And if we cannot see the Arab humanity, what's left? If we feel nothing, if we feel that Arabs are not like us, or not like anyone else, then let's kill them all. Then they deserve to die, right? Arabs think of us that see these movies. Because these movies are running 25 cents American major. Movies showing us killing them. What do they walk away with? Does this bring us closer together? Does this advance peace? Or does it separate us? You're fired. Islamophobia now is a part of our psyche. Words such as Arab and Muslim are perceived as threatening words. And if the words are threatening, what about the images that we see 
in the cinema and on our television screens. We are at war with Iraq. We went to war in March of 2003. But didn't our entrance to the war, wasn't that made a lot easier, primarily because for more than a century we had been vilifying all things Arab? And now, given what happened with 9-11, the tragic events that took place on that day where 19 Arab Muslim terrorists were responsible for the deaths of nearly 3,000 people, now, instead of saying that's the lunatic fringe, we say, no, 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 no. The actions reflect the actions of 1.3 billion people. Now, that's dangerous. We don't say that the actions of Ku Klux Klan members, who are Christians, represent Christianity, do we? Look at Oklahoma City. Timothy McVeigh, a good Irish Catholic boy. Do we say all Irish Catholics are terrorists? I mean, no one knew McVeigh's religious beliefs, where he went to church, or his ethnic background. It was not part of the story. Yet, of course, had that been an American with Arab roots or an American Muslim, it would have been a part of the story. Remember that when news of the bombing broke, reporters and politicians, nearly everybody, rushed to judgment without any proof whatsoever. The U.S. government source told CBS News that it has Middle East terrorism written all over it. The attack in Oklahoma City appears to have a familiar mark. This was done with the attempt to inflict as many casualties as possible. That is a Middle Eastern trait. The fact that it was such a powerful bomb in Oklahoma City immediately drew investigators to consider deadly parallels that all have roots in the Middle East. ABC News has learned that the FBI has asked the U.S. military to provide up to 10 Arabic speakers to help in the investigation. The stereotype has become so widespread that it's become invisible to people. And the reason being is that we've all grown up with these images. Like Just look at television. We now have TV shows telling us that, in addition to the Arab terrorists over there, American Arabs over here are also terrorists. <laughs> Then there's Showtime's Sleeper Cell. Here, a sinister network of Islamic groups operates on American street corners. Any homeless man could be part of this network. Even Western-looking Arabs are part of this anti-American conspiracy. We're at war with America, period. And we're going to win that war by convincing enough Americans through the spread of fear, insecurity, and terror to change their ways. And the best way to teach that lesson is by attacking them where they live, work, and play. And this paranoia runs deep. Just take a moment and flip through some of our most popular religious channels. Islam, a religion of two billion members that's growing by 50 million people annually. Nearly every major terrorist network in the world is led by Islamic fundamentalists. Islam is, as we have seen, a religion that teaches the violent subjugation of all non-Muslims. It promises paradise to terrorists and makes the vilest deed a thing of beauty in the eyes of Allah. So, when innocent Arabs are killed, when they're bombed, maimed, wounded, when they're tortured in places like Abu Ghraib, is it really any surprise that we don't feel any compassion? Or worse, make light of it? This is no different than what happens at the Skull and Bones initiation, and we're going to ruin people's lives over it, and we're going to hamper our military effort. You ever heard of emotional release? You ever heard of need to blow some steam off? Well, yeah, it's sort of, sort of like you know, hazing, a fraternity prank, uh, sort of like that kind of fun. But the point is, you know, everybody's been saying that this came from we don't the top. care about them. We've been preconditioned to think that those innocent civilians, clones of Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein, are one and the same and do not merit our sympathy, our understanding. And that's very dangerous. According to the FBI, hate crimes in America targeting Muslims or people who just appear to be Middle Eastern surged in the aftermath of 9-11. Since 9-11, if you are an Arab American or a Muslim American and you go to an airport, you, you, you're automatically profiled. Uh, numerous thousands of Muslim Americans were rounded up and detained without due process. 
Many people, particularly immigrants, lost their jobs. This college student who asked not to be identified says a recent meeting with police left him feeling like a criminal. And I was just very scared, anxious, nervous, and I just wanted to get it over with. He was one of several thousand men of mostly Arab descent who were interviewed. We so there is this cloud, you know, with the hate crimes, with the profiling, with being rounded up. Again, I think this illustrates the power of film, that in spite of the reality, in spite of the material that we know to be true, we still embrace the mythology. The mythology is still a part of our psyches. Stereotypes take a long time to wither away. And for many of us, we're comfortable with our prejudices. We don't want to change. We've grown accustomed to this face. When we think of Arabs, what do we see? What images come to mind? Do we see actual people? People who, despite real cultural or geographical differences, do pretty much the same things that we do. When we think of Arab women, what images come to mind? Do we see women who laugh and play and who adore their children? Women who work in the home as well as outside? Would it come as a surprise to know that in many Arab countries, a majority of college students are actually women? What's our immediate image of Arab men? Do we see loving fathers? Men who want to provide for their families? What about Arab teenagers? Do we see them the, the way you would think about teenagers in other parts of the world? Then there's religion in the Arab world. Do we see it as all-encompassing, dominating everything else? Do we know that even though faith plays a huge role in the Arab world, just as it does here in the United States, that it's also true that much of the Arab world is quite secular? When we think of Arabs and religion, does Christianity come to mind? Do we remember that there are over 20 million Christians in the region who have lived side by side in harmony with Muslims for centuries? To their credit, some filmmakers have shown Arabs and American Arabs in all their complexities. An excellent way to shatter a stereotype is through laughter, through comedy. So we have comedians. Comedians have done this historically, black comedians, Jewish comedians. So we see Arab comedians doing this, and this is one way to release the tension. I'm based on a credit card, true story. Guy behind the counter picked up my credit card, sees the olive part, looks at me all weird. He's like, hey, buddy, what kind of name is uh, uh, that? I'm like, well, sir, it's an Arabic name. He goes, yeah, what, what does this mean? So I'm like, well, we'll translate it to English. It means peaceful, friendly Arab. <laughs> But he's not happy because, yeah, what Arab country is your family from? So I turned the most peaceful, popular one that he would like. So I'm like, we're from the same Arab country that Aladdin is from. <laughs> to his credit, Michael Moore in Fair Night 9-11 in the DVD includes a scene with this, this comedy coming up. My name really is Ahmed Ahmed, and I can't fly anywhere. <laughs> All you white people have it easy. You guys get to the airport like an hour, two hours before your flight. It takes me a month and a half. <laughs> Security's gotten so bad, now I just show up to the airport in a G-string. I'm like, hey, you guys up? The character I read for was terrorist number four. Not number one, not <laughs> number two, number four. And, um, and I was already well into my comedy career at this point, <clears throat> so I didn't take it that serious. And I read my lines way over the top. And, uh, you know, it's like, shut down, you will obey, or I'll kill you in the name of Allah, you know, th stuff like that. And the director went nuts, and he was like, that was brilliant, Ahmad. Let me see you do it again, but this time with more, you know, Arab, you know how your people are very, you know, he's trying to say that we're angry, and I was just like, okay, angry, is that what you want? Yes, yes. So I did it one more time, and I got a call the next morning that they want to use me in this movie. And I started laughing on the phone because I wasn't even, like, I was making fun of, of, the, part, of, of the role. I wasn't trying to be like that. And, and that's what they want, though. And once we begin to humanize Arabs and Muslims, to project them as we project other people, no better, 
no worse, then the stereotype gradually diminishes. In movies such as A Perfect Murder, we see an Arab-American detective befriend the heroine. Then there's Three Kings, a movie I served as a consultant on. The action occurs during the first Gulf War in 1991. The film is notable for revealing the complexities of the Iraqi people, focusing on decent Iraqis that Saddam Hussein wants to kill. How's your little girl? She's safe for now. Outstanding, excellent. How can we help you? There's mutual respect in this film. And there's also Iraqis who are loyal to Saddam Hussein. It's not a sugar-coated film. It's a very realistic film. It's an outstanding film, in my opinion. Kingdom of Heaven, which focuses on the Crusades, was a tremendous hit overseas, not here in the United States. And when the film was shown in Beirut, particularly at the end, when Salah Adin takes over Jerusalem, there's peace between Muslim and Christian. He enters a church, and there is an icon on the floor. Salah Adin sees the icon, respectfully picks it up, and places it back on the altar. When audiences in Beirut saw that, they rose to their feet and applauded. We're talking about Muslims as well as Christians applauding the act of a Muslim who embraces religious tolerance. There is this need of Arab audiences to embrace American films that show them in a respectful, honest, fair manner. And with the release of George Clooney's Syriana, I have hoped that Hollywood may be listening. The film has some unflattering yet honest depictions of Arabs, but it also presents an Arab prince as one of the film's few decent human beings. The British-educated prince wants to bring democracy to his country, and his ideals get him and his family murdered. I want to create a parliament. I want to give women the right to vote. I want an independent judiciary. I want to start a petroleum exchange in the Middle East. I'll put all of our energy up for competitive bidding. I'll run pipe through Iran to Europe like you proposed. I'll ship to China. Anything that achieves efficiency and maximizes profit. Profit which I will then use to rebuild my country. Great. That's exactly what you should do. Exactly. Except your president rings my father and says I've got unemployment in Texas, Kansas, Washington State. One phone call later, we're stealing out of our social programs in order to buy overpriced airplanes. Another example of this kind of humanity and respect is found in Hideous Kinky, a film about an English woman played by Kate Winslet and her two daughters in Morocco. Winslet's relationship with her Moroccan lover is beautifully and lovingly displayed. And when she doesn't have the money to return home to England with her daughters, he makes hard sacrifices to make it happen. There's a tender and moving scene at the end the Moroccan catches up with the train they're on to say goodbye, to wish them well. We see the warmth and love that exists between them. And nowhere is this kind of humanity more visible than in the film Paradise Now, written and directed by Hani Abu Assad. Two Palestinian friends get recruited to carry out a suicide bombing on Tel Aviv. At first they accept their mission solemnly, but they're intercepted at the Israeli border and separated from their hand. Then a young woman realizes their plan and forces them to question their actions. <laughs> هيك بتقتلوا بتصير زيهم 
These three young Palestinians are different from each other. They're not just crazed terrorists, and they're not just freedom fighters. They're human beings, with all the faults, excesses, ideals, and pain of human beings. نجتهد نباك على الله بس ربنا كل لك فكر قبل ما تعمل رح نموت نموت ناس معنا مش رح يتغير ولا إشي مش موت من رح يغير تكمل في نضال يروح تغير أنا ما عنديش خيار تاني على التكمل إذا ما تغير شي شي رد إذا ما تغير شي شي I'm an optimist and I believe in the future particularly in young filmmakers the stereotype will change it will change because young men and women who are entering the profession will see that there has been a grave injustice committed and they'll make attempts to correct it. It's only a matter of time as to when this will happen, but it will take place. Look, we've unlearned many of our prejudices against blacks, Native Americans, Jews, other groups. Why can't we unlearn our prejudices against Arabs and Muslims? What matters is not to remain silent, I think whenever we see anyone being vilified on a regular basis, we have to speak out, whether we're image makers or not. We have to take a stand and say this is morally and ethically 